Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon from a hot and tropical London, completely unseasonal weather we're having this early September. Uh, I'm Paul Mullins, and on behalf of Callanish, I'd like to say a big welcome to our September edition of our Scrap and Iron Ore Markets Focus. Uh, I'm joined this afternoon by Thomas Gutierrez and Burchak Altman, and together with about 300 registered attendees. So a big welcome to all of you. So I'm going to hand over the, the microphone and the screen now to Thomas, who's going to give us his thoughts on the iron ore market. Thomas, over to you. Thanks, Paul. And uh, welcome to everybody. Thanks for joining us again. Um, as Paul said, I'm going to be talking uh, about iron ore, uh, about China, uh, updating some of our outlook for China as well. Um, but first things first, um, I'm going to go back to the poll that we had in last month's iron ore scrap webinar and uh, congratulate you all because it was a rather impressive forecast, more or less got it uh, exactly right. Uh, the biggest section of votes was for prices to end up being at a month ago's level currently and prices are really just a few cents off that, so uh, well done. Prices had uh, started by declining um, shortly after our previous webinar, but prices uh, came back at the end. At the time, we'd uh, mentioned that our expectation was for prices to be uh, steady to down slightly. Um, the steadiness basically has been due to continued very high Chinese steel output, uh, good uh, continuing uh, growth in Chinese steel demand, and also a fluctuating uh, supply over different periods. We'll go into that in a little bit more depth uh, in a moment, but before that, I'd like to run into uh, this month's poll and see where you expect prices to be in a month's time again. Thank you, Thomas. So, this first poll of the afternoon is, where do you see the core 62% FE fines index in one month's time? Thanks, Paul. Um, so even clearer uh, this month, more or less the same, though, more, more of the same. 44% of people expect prices in uh, 125 to $135 a ton, uh, followed by 31% of people expecting prices at 115 to $125 a ton. Uh, it's an interesting result in that it really does reflect the two kind of uh, predominant viewpoints in the market currently. Prices had picked up at the start of the week, but today prices are falling. So uh, falling back towards the mid 120s. Um, so there is a, the possibility of prices falling uh, below that. Uh, if we go back to the slides, though, I'll, I'll explain our own outlook and why we more or less agree with the majority in this case. If we um, look at the uh, three basic options for uh, you know how things might develop going forward, there is one scenario which is for uh, weaker demand than expected, which does see prices fall uh, down to that $115 to $125 a ton level. That would be premised on uh, continued uh, weakness in sentiment. Uh, sentiment has really been driving the decline in the, in the last couple of days, particularly uh, impacts on the outlook for, for real estate, which I'll talk a bit more about later. But our base case is, is not for that to happen. Our, our base case is, in fact, for prices to uh, increase slightly, but probably still within that 125 to 135 range, increasing to around $130 a tonne. That is premised simply on the fact that uh, we have the October holiday coming up. That means that we have a period of mill restocking coming up uh, at the end of the month. Some mills had brought that restocking forward when prices uh, fell uh, earlier in the month. Some mills brought forward their restocking to take advantage of the higher prices, but there are still uh, significant volumes expected to be moved from port stocks to mills in the next two weeks, and that should sustain prices uh, and possibly push prices up a little higher in the next couple of weeks. There's also uh, some question over demand later in the year. 
uh, and also potentially supply later in the year. Obviously, this is the year of the coronavirus, and so all things are vulnerable to uh, uncertainties and unexpected events. So we do have a, a weak supply, strong demand uh, scenario here, which uh, would be the case if another outbreak of coronavirus impacts iron ore supply and uh, demand remains very strong in China, you could see prices remaining very firm. But again, that is not our base case. Our base case is for iron ore prices to slide after the strong period this autumn and in Q4 in particular, by the end of the year, we do expect prices to be lower. So let's talk a little bit about what is driving prices. Firstly, Chinese steel demand. It has recovered from its uh, slightly weaker period in the summer. Data for August, which we'll see in a moment, shows some recovery, and some recovery has continued into September. However, expectations had been very high, and the recovery in demand has been slower than some have expected. And so even though there's an increase in, in demand, there's no uh, there's been a, a limited increase in steel prices, and that is, is obviously acting as a bit of a cap on iron ore prices as well. Within iron ore itself, there's been issues in port side stocks, in particular for key products such as PV fines. Um, one of the, the causes of, of the, the weakness earlier in the month was that PV fine stocks were increasing for a period. However, there is a slight pullback in supply from Australia and uh, overall steel production remains high and demand remains high. And so we see that as, as a fluctuation. It's not a trend that iron ore stocks will increase and put pressure on prices in the next few weeks. Thirdly, steel making margins are still squeezed. That's really a product of, of the previous two factors, the fact that iron ore is strong and still uh, has not quite met expectations. In particular, for rebar producers, there's a, a very limited room for maneuver between steel and iron ore prices. And that means if steel prices come under pressure, so do iron ore prices. If iron ore prices increase, there's a, they bump up against this cap of, of Chinese steel prices. And lastly, as I mentioned uh, previously, the October holiday restocking, which should uh, become more prominent in the next two weeks and should push iron ore prices uh, back from the decline that they're currently experiencing. So a little bit closer look at the data. Um, we now have uh, preliminary end use demand data for August. Uh, this is based on crude steel production, trade and inventories. Um, we don't have finalized uh, trade data yet because it comes out later in the month, but this is the preliminary estimate. We have August uh, real steel demand increasing uh, in August from July, but still some way off the peak that we saw over May and uh, April and May. That demand is increasing again into this month, as we said, and so we do uh, expect a further recovery. If you look at year on year growth rates, Throughout the summer, they have remained at very high levels, and we expect that to continue in September and October. And so the demand picture is still um, that demand is recovering, and we should still see strong demand in uh, September and October, and that in turn should justify high steel production and strong iron ore demand. On the basis of some of the, the data that we've seen recently, we've also revised our annual forecasts for Chinese steel demand. So I'd like to go through that very briefly. Um, in the China Steel Intelligence, which we publish monthly, we normally revise our forecasts twice a year. Normally, uh, we issue an, an initial forecast um, at the start of the year and revise mid-year, but this year, obviously, with everything becoming so volatile, we've issued an additional revision. So in the last CSI, we issued some new numbers. We uh, have revised uh, both, uh, well, all crude steel output, apparent demand, and end user demand upwards. We now expect 2020 crude steel production at 1.02 billion tons this year, uh, which is an increase of around 3%. 
We expect apparent demand to increase more significantly by around 7% to uh, 954 million tonnes and end user demand to increase 5.2% to 944 million tonnes. Uh, the reason for the slower end user demand is obviously that inventory levels are considerably higher than last year and they're expected to remain stubbornly high through the rest of the year. The recovery in steel demand so far has not been able to drag down steel inventories and so uh, some of that demand will go into inventory. Worth noting there is that our apparent finished steel demand forecast is considerably higher currently than World Steel's forecast for apparent steel demand, which was last issued at 1% growth. Uh, if World Steel is issuing its next short range outlook next month, uh, which it normally would do, uh, it's worth looking out and seeing if they revise those figures upwards as we expect. So I want to look a little bit at what's happening in the short term and what's happening in the longer term. The reason why we still expect strong demand and uh, firm prices in the short term is uh, infrastructure and construction activity primarily. We talk about infrastructure every month, so I, I, I think we've already discussed several times how well-financed projects are, local government bond issuance uh, and other forms of financial support have been really pouring in over the summer. And so projects are well-funded for a strong construction season in the autumn. But I thought I would share here some of the positive news from the real estate sector that came out uh, this week. And that is the steady increase in real estate investment and in real estate sales. Um, this is uh, a short term trend. It's the recovery from the coronavirus and the longer term trend is a little bit more problematic. And we'll look at that in a moment. But for the short term, uh, we do have uh, real estate sales volumes increasing at more than 10% a year annually again, which is a what a developers would consider a fairly minimal healthy level really and real estate investment has also remained pretty steady at around 11 percent uh, year on year over july and august and so this all continues to suggest uh, fairly steady and strong activity in the next two months The larger question is uh, what happens now? We've, we've gone through a very dramatic year in terms of the coronavirus and the response to the coronavirus. And that story is starting to come to an end and China is now really focusing on what it wants going forward. And that is gonna bring a number of problems to uh, the steel market and to iron ore markets. If we're looking at what, what policy is coming up, there's a considerable amount of economic planning underway. So Xi Jinping and Liu He have introduced this dual circulation uh, idea as a, as a framework for economic policy going forward. It's not been defined publicly in detail, but it has been discussed widely behind the scenes and is filtering its way into policy work. The core ideas are uh, really around transforming the Chinese economy in a healthier direction. And the key trends, I think, uh, in terms of big picture trends are that the focus is on consumption rather than investment and on technological upgrading rather than traditional industries. So that means that the economic policy focus is really fo looking at uh, employment and income and ensuring that people are seeing their incomes increase so they can consume more and uh, to put it in a very simple uh, simple uh, summary uh, the policy is focused on creating more uh, chip designers and computer programmers and less people welding bits of rebar together to build lots of concrete apartment blocks so that is obviously going to have a very big impact on steel in the longer term. The 
specific policies that will be around that are likely to mean that financing becomes tighter. Uh, it's likely to mean that property markets are more restricted, and, and we saw that this week already, that uh, some local governments are starting to restrict uh, property sales. And as the coronavirus drama passes, China will be going back towards its policy of real estate being uh, a home to live in rather than an investment. That's obviously is going to mean less demand for steel intensive construction. And it also means that support is likely to move towards tax. So all of those local government special bonds, some of it will still be going into infrastructure construction, but a growing proportion will be going into supporting technological developments and R&D and other less steel intensive areas. And then there's another factor, which I'll only mention briefly currently, but uh, the opening up of scrap markets in 2021 this again is a policy that has not been finalized but is widely expected if china begins importing larger volumes of scrap that will also create a number of secondary disruptions for iron ore and steel markets in china and globally so what can we expect now in the short term uh, the markets should remain fairly firm and supported still demand is still improving steel production is still very high, iron ore demand is high, and uh, there's no sudden increase in iron ore supply expected. So fairly tight markets and fairly supported. Once we get over the peak season, however, there should be a decline in demand into the winter. And that could be, uh, it could mean some growing pressure on prices, unless of course there's another supply disruption. In addition to that, because of the trend in the economic framework, there's uh, a certain amount of risk to sentiment over the next six months. Policy is being discussed and set now and should be rubber stamped in theory around the end of March next year. That means that over the next six months, policies will be gradually released in various official and unofficial forms ahead of actually being approved. And because of the change in policy, that is more likely to mean a negative impact on sentiment for the steel sector and for iron ore than a positive impact. And then generally in 2021, there's also a, another more fundamental issue, which is that this year has seen such a significant amount of steel demand growth and such a significant amount of support from the state for steel intensive sectors that in 2021, any growth will be difficult to sustain. And so in 2021, we do expect a weaker year than most of this year. I'm going to leave it there, but uh, please do ask me any questions. I'll ask Paul back now and uh, I'll answer any questions that you have after Burchak has given her presentation. Thank you. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Burchak, who's going to give us her perspective on how the scrap markets are functioning. Bocek, over to you. Thank you, Paul. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome all. Before going into details, I will start with some statistics from Turkey steel Intel industry as usual. We have already covered first half statistics during our previous webinar in August. What happened in July? Moving one step up, Turkey ranked seventh largest producer, while Germany fell to ninth. In July, among the 10 largest producers, only China, Turkey, Brazil, and Iran have recorded an increase in crude steel production, while the others recorded a decline. In the first quarter, I don't have the latest data for, for scrap consumption, so I'll, I'll share the data from scrap. Um, in the first quarter, China was the largest consumer with 41.5 uh, million tons, while Turkey ranked sixth with 7.5 4 million tons. Turkey produced 19.4 million tons of crude steel in the seven months of 2020. 13 million of the total production came from electric arc furnaces, and 6.4 million tons were out of blast furnaces. Electric arc furnace steel producers share among the total is 67%. 
coming to Turkey's carbon consumption, um, Turkey consumed 15.2 million tons of scrap in the seven months of this year, with 3.1 million from the domestic market and 12 million from imports. Although domestic scrap share among Turkey's total scrap consumption in the first quarter was uh, 28.3, it fell to 20.9 in January-July period. This was also a sharp fall compared with 32.6 last year. That the total supply accounts for only 20 to 30 percent of its total scrap consumption makes Turkey the world's leading scrap importer. With 12 million of imports in seven months, Turkey's scrap imports increased 11 percent on year, despite the 2.4 percent decrease seen in crude steel production. Turkey sourced 61% of its scrap imports from the EU, 21 from the US, and 11 from the CIS. On country basis, however, the US was the largest supplier with 2.5 million tons, up 28.8% on year. It was followed by the Netherlands with 1.5 million tons and Russia with 1.2 million tons. This chart shows the price trend of Turkish imported scrap in 2020. It is based on daily price changes and represents Baltic and US origin HMS 8 to 20. As seen, after hitting bottom in March, prices have recovered and hit 2020 high in September. Before examining which factors have been effective on imported scrap prices recently, we have a small poll where we want to see what you think about current scrap prices at $300 CFR Turkey right now. Thank you, Bulcek. So, Bulcek's first question for the uh, attendees this afternoon is, how do you see the current HMS 8020 price level in Turkey, uh, currently at $300 a ton CFR Turkey? Okay, most of our attendees, uh, particularly 46% of our attendees, find current levels healthy, uh, while 42 find them high and 12 find them low. Okay, let's see uh, what factors we have behind the prices. So, what happened in Turkey's scrap market since June this year? Turkey's scrap demand, which has resumed in mid-May, continued until mid-June. Due to the insufficient scrap supply arising from the virus during this period. After mid-June, however, with the respite they got with scrap purchases, Turkish mills slowed their demand. Coupled with the recovery seen in scrap supply, following the ease of coronavirus measures, scrap prices started softening. After the first week of July, the sharp increase seen in iron ore prices, returned confidence in Chinese market, and Turkey's obvious need for August shipment scrap purchases caused scrap suppliers to increase their offer prices. Supported by the strong demand in Turkey and Asia, scrap prices have shown a steady increase until mid-August. Turkish mills, um, who had seen that they were unable to sell rebars at a price that covers their production costs, have halted scrap purchases for two weeks in August. While they were unable to lower prices at desired levels, they had to accept higher prices on their return due to um, Euro dollar parity at almost 1.2, high duck prices in the EU, positive sentiment in the USA, strong Asian scrap demand, and iron ore prices which approached record highs. Meanwhile, scrap prices have, have increased up to $50 in September trading in the US. Duck prices in the EU have reached 210 to 15 euros. These, coupled with the stronger euro, caused scrap prices to hit and even exceed $300 for the first time since the beginning of the year in early September. Last week, however, um, once Turkish mills have seen that there are more than sufficient scrap cargoes available in the market and they are able to buy scrap at lower prices, they have once again stopped their scrap purchases. Um, the latest scrap booking last week appeared at $300 CFR, $300 CFR uh, which is $1.5 lower than the previous deal from the same destination. 
um, Turkish mills are now targeting lower prices while exerting pressure on prices. Today, Turkish mill price ex Turkish mills price expectations are heard to be standing at low to 90 levels. How was the situation with rebars? Turkish mills have been forced to reflect scrap price increases in rebar prices in early June. Um, however, increased prices have not seen acceptance in the global market, and um, as a result of the contraction in the global rebar demand, Turkey had to lower prices again until bearing higher prices for scrap in early July. Um, with, with the sharp increase seen in scrap prices after July, Turkey has raised rebar prices as a result of higher production costs, stronger domestic rebar demand, China's strong demand for imports, and increased confidence in the global steel market. All have faced resistance um, from buyers time to time, Turkish mills have achieved to sell some large tonnage cargoes to Singapore and Hong Kong. With an almost steady increase since July, Last week, rebar export prices have reached pre-pandemic levels in January, and domestic rebar prices have hit 2020 high. Um, after a long break, Turkey has sold rebars to the US last week, following the increases seen in US domestic rebar prices. Meanwhile, domestic rebar prices in the EU are also following an upward trend. Um, Turkey, however, has decreased rebar offer prices by $5 this week, as prices saw no acceptance from global buyers. Export and domestic offer prices for Turkish rebars decreased to 455 and 460 FOB and 454 and 458 XWorks, respectively. Domestic demand has also slowed this week. I, meanwhile, I think I have to add some comments for flat steel as well, uh, because flat is also uh, playing an important role now. Uh, HRC prices in Turkey, which were below rebar prices only a few, month, a few months ago, have increased to 440-445 X-Works levels as a result of mills longer utilization. HRC producers have managed to increase scrap HRC price margin significantly recently. This graph here shows the trend of HMS 80 to 20 CFR Turkey scrap and Turkish rebar FOB prices since 2018. As Turkey is highly dependent on imported scrap, imported scrap and rebar prices follow similar trends most of the time, though the margin tightens and widens time to time. And this graph refers to the scrap rebar margin. Between 2015 and January 2020, average margin between scrap and rebar appeared at $174.2, with high fluctuations, as you can see on this graph. The red line here shows the average margin, which is $174.2. Um, while the blue line refers to the average cost, we consider 160 as the average rebar production cost from scrap with a very rough calculation. However, we have to keep in mind that uh, the lower the utilization equals higher production costs. Uh, although the margin has hit 142 levels, which is the lowest since March 2017, in January and May this year, it has then recovered. Scrap prices have risen by $44 since the beginning of July. Turkish mills, however, have increased rebar export prices by $50 during this period with the support of their domestic rebar demands. Um, as a result, the margin has increased up to $165 in previous month in August. Today, however, uh, margin has once again dropped to $155, which is below average cost. This graph here demonstrates the cost of rebars from billet versus scrap. Um, assuming billet is at 432 CFR Turkey and scrap is at 300 CFR Turkey, producing rebars from billets is more advantageous versus producing from scrap today. 
indeed most of the time producing from bills is more advantageous as you can see on this chart today there is a difference of eight dollars between producing from scrap and billet with billet having the advantage so before our sh before sharing our outlook with you we would like to see where you see the scrap prices in the coming period here comes our second poll question thank you very much Bulchak. so this question is where do you see the cfr turkish scrap price level in october thank you paul okay uh, so most of our attendees expect prices to remain at 20 290 310 levels which is in line with our expectations actually as you will see now and 39 percent thinks prices may further soften and 13 uh, percent expect higher prices about 310 and the number of people waiting prices at 250 270 levels are low <laughs> okay before getting into details with our outlook i want to share some news that may affect turkish scrap market directly or indirectly in the future in august iron ore prices hit almost 130 dollars the highest since january 2014. today fluctuating just under 130 dollars still making margins are under severe pressure for blast furnaces U.S. dollar Turkish lira exchange rate, which has followed a sideways trend in June and July, has sharply increased in the beginning of August. A dollar equivalent of Turkish lira increased from 6.84 to 7.38 only in a few days. While depreciation of the lira continues since then, current exchange rate stands at 7.48. The euro dollar parity has also recorded sharp increases since our previous webinar and hit 119, which is two year high. Um, the World Trade Organization has established an official dispute panel to review the complaint lodged by Turkey against European safeguard measures on steel imports. On July 17, Turkey requested the establishment of the panel with the hope that the panel will issue its final report to the parties in six months from the date when terms of reference of the panel are agreed upon. However, the panel has not been composed yet. Fitch Ratings has affirmed Turkey's credit rating at BB- on August 24th. The outlook has been revised from stable to negative. This was mostly the result of increased external financial risks arising from weak monetary policy, current account deficit, negative real interest rates, um, political pressures, um, market instability, and some other factors. In August, China imported 2.2 million, million tons of finished steel, a decrease of 14% from the previous month, but a year-on-year -year increase of 131%. This helped China's eight-month imports of steel reach 12.1 million tons, a year-on-year -year increase of 60%. This growth shows that China's steel demand is exceptionally strong in 2020, but it is still down compared to the summer. Uh, meanwhile, China's steel exports decreased by 18.6% on year from January to August. Uh, after a st very stagnant period due to, due to the coronavirus pandemic, we are currently in a period of strong recovery. Economies are opening up, production is resuming towards normal levels, and demand is stronger in most parts of the world. Um, inventory is dropped too low and need to be replenished. Steel prices in the EU and EU USA are recovering. Sheet prices, which have increased by $40 in late August, have increased once again on Monday by $60 in the US. This is the third increase in sheet prices since late July. Uh, rebar prices have also increased by $40 in the US last week. Demand is picking up across Europe and it is understood. Also, metal mills are well booked into Q4. 
uh, ArcelorMittal is currently implementing a series of price increases um, for new orders of long products in Europe. Latin American steel industry has also entered the recovery stage. The US government has announced that it has cut the import quota for semi-finished steel from Brazil. Brazil's remaining 2020 quota for semi-finished steel will be reduced to 60,000 tons from uh, 350,000 tons. The US will remain existing quotas for other Brazilian steel products. So our outlook for semi-finished and finished steel markets. Chinese steel exports have been subject to 15 new anti-dumping investigations in the first nine months of the year, more than all of last year, as the US-China trade war and the coronavirus pandemic have hastened the trend towards global protectionism. Uh, each day we hear new measures coming from different countries. As the situation, the virus has started to get has started getting worse, and we will hear more of them. Second term European quotas, which will open in October, will be filled quickly, as Turkey as Turkey has already completed the sales of certain products for the second term. Um, although Turkey has the capability of reaching new destinations. Um, new markets will most likely be unable to cover the gap arising from Europe's absence. As a result, we're expecting a decrease in Turkish exports. With demand remaining limited and competition being tough, particularly in Asia, we are expecting buyers' pressure on steel prices to continue. Turkish domestic demand is expected to lose its strength uh, compared with summer, of course, uh, as Turkish government has cancelled some of the incentives given in June. On the other hand, fast spreading virus, increasing interest rates, and high fluctuations seen in the currencies co cause buyers to follow a caution stance. Uh, although the domestic market is still outperforming exports, most market players express uh, concern over the risk that domestic market fundamentals are not solid. China, uh, instead of being a threat, took advantage of low prices and concluded purchases from the global market. Um, although some fluctu fluctuations are observed in Chinese steel demand recently, uh, Chinese demand is not expected to record a slump as investment activities and stimulus measures in China are positive. And strong Chinese domestic demand is expected to keep Chinese steel from depressing export destinations. Um, Turkish origin steel imports into the US surged 8% on year in January, July to 339,000 tons, despite the section 232 and anti-dumping duties. Uh, this was due to an this was due to an almost sevenfold increase in long shipments to 309,000 tons, and it came despite an 80 percent and 73 percent drop, respectively, in pipe and flat supply. With the price increases seen in the U.S. domestic market recently, we are expecting Turkish long steel exports to the destination to continue. And um, I'm hearing that there are ongoing negotiations in the market. Virus is back. Uh, we are observing a huge increase in the number of infected people and deaths. Most countries have announced the arrival of second wave and lockdowns have restarted. Um, I think this is the highest risk among all in the world as new measures and lockdowns will most probably be back. And our outlook for scrap with the end of the holidays, summer heat, and support from increasing steel prices, we expect scrap flow to accelerate in main supplier countries. Uh, in the U US, capacity utilization rate has increased to 65%, but still down from 78% last year, like in other countries. As a result, despite the recovery, steel production is still well below last year's levels. So we are not expecting scrap supply to be a problem in the near term, despite the fall in industrial scrap output. Uh, as 
armor prices are high and continue to squeeze glass furnace and makers margins, we are expecting glass furnace that demand to increase. As Turkey has been unsuccessful in selling rebar that desired quantities at current off prices in the global market, Turkish mills are seen to be exerting pressure on scrap prices while halting their purchases and focusing on finished steel sales. However, October shipment deep sea purchases have not yet been fully completed. As a result, Turkish mills are expected to return to scrap, scrap purchases in two weeks latest. U.S. scrap prices settled in less than three days with a higher than expected increase in September. Um, continuing mills appetite for scrap, increasing finished steel prices, and export prices are expected to support scrap pricing in October in the US. Most market participants don't predict a downside, downside trend in October, though um, expected price increase to be much modest compared with September. As Thomas has already covered, iron ore prices are expected to remain strong. Um, with the recovery seen in steel demand and mills higher utilization rate after the holidays, European scrap demand is expected to further rise in the near term. Some 34% um, of blast furnaces idled during the peak of COVID-19 pandemic are being restarted. In other words, of the idled furnaces globally, 22 are restarting due to the recovery seen in demand or to avoid compromising their long-term production. And the current trend is set to continue further. This will for sure increase the demand for raw materials. However, it also carries the risk of a finished steel oversupply during winter when demand slows and virus peaks. Well, in the middle of all these uncertainties and regional disparities, I wouldn't say it's the best time to make a prediction for scrap prices. But we think Turkey's pressure on scrap prices will most likely end with some price decreases as there are many unsold cargoes in the market. We expect prices to see a correction, not a sharp fall, until current cargoes are sold and Turkey's demand for October shipment cargoes restarts. We expect this decline to be limited because local scrap and finished steel demand and prices in main supplier countries are recovering. With the resuming Turkey's scrap demand, we are expecting prices to strengthen again. But of course, there are facts that impact the prices and are unpredictable, such as political developments, trade wars, new anti-dumping cases, sudden changes in foreign exchange rates, and so on. And said before, uh, virus is carrying the highest risk among all, I think. That was the end of my presentation. Thanks for listening. I'll hand over to Paul. Thank you very much, Burchak. Very interesting and informative. Uh, Thomas, if you'd like to jump back on screen as well, we'll start to go through some of the questions that we've received both before the, the, the webinar and also in the course of this webinar, we've re received quite a few as well. So I'll start with one that we got, uh, in fact, it's a combination of a, uh, about four requests from different people. So obviously a very popular topic and it's for you, Thomas. So it's why is China having such a strong impact on iron ore prices and not on scrap? And will that change? Um, there's, um, partly it's to do with the, the, the different structures of the, the iron ore and scrap markets. Iron ore is very dominated by imports into China, in particular the seaborne market, and in particular the spot seaborne market. Whereas China currently is not importing significant amounts of scrap, that's largely due to restrictions. And in fact, one of the reasons why China is now importing significant amounts of steel and significant amounts of DRI and pig iron is that it is currently unable to import as much scrap as it would like. So currently the impact of China on international scrap markets is um, small, other than the fact that it is absent. But once that change happens 
in 2021, if China does allow significant amounts of scrap imports, then China could very rapidly become a major scrap importer. Uh, in that case, you would probably see iron ore and scrap prices becoming much more linked and obviously with an increase in demand for international scrap supplies, then uh, scrap would be supported uh, by Chinese demand as well. And so that could change next year once new policies come in. Thank you very much, Thomas. Burtek, is there anything you'd like to jump in on on that point? Um, I totally agree with Thomas. The only thing I can add is that, you know, uh, iron ore prices has increased uh, higher than scrap because Chinese was, China was the exception, China was exceptionally strong until today, unlike the other markets. While the situation in other markets were really stagnant, China was running. So that, that's another reason for, for this difference, I think. Thank you. Uh, question now for you, Bulchak, which is, will scrap play a more pivotal role in helping Western steel producers increase output post-COVID, if we get to a point where we are post-COVID? Um, uh, yes, Paul, uh, actually scrap will most probably play an important role because despite the scrap prices at over $300, electric arc furnaces have the advantage in producing as a result of very high prices of iron ore. Uh, blast furnaces will also likely to raise scrap consumption uh, as much as they can. Uh, I think which is, which is higher highest is 20 percent as far as i know coupled with the increase in steel output scrap is becoming more important i can say yes okay thank you very much um right thomas over to you here um i just mentioned the covid virus the, the, the word that probably sums up 2020 what would be the short-term impact of a second wave of covid in from your perspective yeah, so the, the key question is going to be where is the outbreak of COVID? So at the moment, it seems as though China remains on top of the virus. And so we, sh we are not expecting currently a big outbreak in China. And so the demand side for seaborne iron ore should remain um, fairly strong in the short term and really determined on Chinese steel demand. If there's a second outbreak in Europe, which we're already seeing, that will have an impact on demand for iron ore, but it will also be, uh, in terms of volumes, relatively small compared to the impact of China on the spot market. What could have a bigger impact is if we see the virus having a greater impact on countries that are supplying iron ore, then you could see um, a more significant impact on prices if supply tightens, um, then you could see another spike in, in iron ore prices. So really the question is, um, where will it have the greatest impact? Will it be in countries that are supplying iron ore or on countries that are consuming iron ore? Thank you. Uh, we, we've received, in fact, it was the first question we received uh, during your presentation, Thomas. So I'm going to jump into that one now, which is, um, I feel that the impact of the pandemic on iron ore supplies will go down with time. It will be more based on the supply demand of steel. With the increased supply of finished goods in coming months, prices may drop, in turn impacting iron ore prices too. What is your view on that? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it all depends on the time frame that you're talking about. Certainly, if we're assuming that there's no coronavirus impact on iron ore supply, then that's correct to point out you know, steel supply and demand is, is really key. Within China, we will see, we're seeing very strong supply already, but we should see demand then drop off a little bit uh, later in the year. And I've, as I mentioned in the presentation as well, because margins are quite narrow, especially for, for rebar producers, any decline in steel prices will put a lot of pressure on iron ore prices. So that is a key factor in why we expect iron ore prices to end the year below where they are now. Understood. Thank you. Um, 
question received after that during the presentations, um, Burchak, it came in your presentation, I think it's for you. Um, you mentioned the comparison of blast furnace and EAF, and it was, what is the optimal length of time for a blast furnace to be banked? Um, actually, that's not my expertise, but uh, as far as I know, it is three to six months. I mean, the minimum length of the blast furnace is banked is approximately three months due to, to the economical reasons. And the maximum is six months after which, is, which it is hard to sustain the heat. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, somebody raised that question for you specifically, so I thought I'd throw that out to you there. Um, a question, which you, you both, well, Thomas, you've touched on slightly, so I'll bring it to you first, which is how elastic is the relationship between iron ore and scrap prices? Yeah, I think it goes back to the previous question, actually. So currently, there is a slight disconnect between iron ore and scrap, and I think that's really because the drivers are separate, and um, mainly because iron ore is driven by China and scrap is being driven by the rest of the world, and obviously, especially uh, Turkey. Uh, also in Asia, you know, Taiwan, Vietnam, and so on. Um, but they have very different trends. Once China, if China comes back into the scrap market in a very big way and it's you know, you know becoming a, a major scrap importer, then you will start to see iron ore and scrap prices much more uh, entangled with each other. If one goes up, the other one will be forced higher. Thank you. And, and Burchak, obviously Turkey at the moment we we use our um... Turkish 8020 CFR price as our benchmark price. What what do you see the impact on the global scrap market of potentially China opening its doors to more scrap imports? And how much are people talking about that as a future um, influencer on the market? Uh, if China comes, in, actually China has uh, sufficient inventories, I think, sufficient inventories of scrap. I don't know, maybe Thomas can give more exact numbers about this, but uh, in, initially maybe China can, China's effect may be less, but once China starts importing in larger volume, it will uh, most probably affect Turkey's pricing because Turkey was the largest buyer, but not the consumers. But now yeah. China is the largest consumer, so it is actually upon how long, how much China will import, how much scrap, what's at what tonnages, but it will for sure have an have an effect, have an effect. Thank you, Burcek. Um, a question that's come into us just recently on this topic is, what is your view about the reclassification of steel scrap by the Chinese authorities as a raw material rather than garbage and the prospects for large-scale imports of steel scrap? Again, this is part of the, the same issue about allowing scrap imports. The, the ban on scrap imports was, um, as the question implies, linked to uh, the ban on imports of waste products. So China was also a big importer of other people's uh, yeah. recycling and scrap really got caught up in that. Uh, that also happened in several other countries as well, in Southeast Asia, for example. Um, the reclassification is an important first step in allowing imports. Um, and the, the goal for the industry, you know, that there are frameworks in place to develop China's scrap recycling industry. One of the reasons that the, the scrap import ban passed was that the focus was on developing domestic scrap processing capacity. and so. There was a, a group that considered imports to be a threat to that. Um, but it has emerged that actually China's scrap supply is not yet developed enough to do without imports, at least at current steel production levels. That We do expect that to change. We expect China to become more or less fully scrap self-sufficient uh, within two to three years. But in the short term, there will be uh, periods when China uh, is in China's interest if it wants to sustain steel output to import scrap. And so, yeah, I think that the reclassification is an important first stage in allowing that. And once China does allow scrap imports, it should 
periodically come into the market. Thank you. Thomas, I've got a question which has come in during the presentation, which is China this year is expected to exceed a billion tonnes of crude steel. Um, when will China reach peak steel and what sort of production and demand profile are we now expecting? Yeah, so people have been predicting peak Chinese steel for years and it's never quite happened. <laughs> um, Not yet. So, but at risk of, of, you know, potentially being wrong again, I think we are basically there. Um, there isn't a lot of underlying uh, sense for China to increase steel production. It's possible that you could see some increases, um, but considering uh, what I think in the presentation as well, that you know, economic policy is really turning away from infrastructure. Um, you know, Beijing is trying to control growing risk from real estate developers, which are, are bloated and, and under serious debts and could you know, risk a financial crisis. There's a, a very strong sense that growth in China going forward will not be as steel intensive as it is currently. And once you combine that with demographics and the fact that population is peaking, you know, working age populations already peaked, um, the, the outlook for Chinese steel demand is uh, largely negative going forward. Um, a slow decline over the next five to 10 years, I think is, is likely. So we're, we're more or less at the peak now. We can't get much further. And that's your official answer? That's my official answer. <laughs> See what happens. Thank you, Thomas. You're in good company there, because I remember I arrived in Shanghai um, to work for three years in 2009. I remember at the time, Li Xin Chuang, who obviously very influential in the Chinese steel industry, president of the Chinese Metallurgical Planning and Research Institute, he said to me categorically that China would never, ever, ever have a billion tons of crude steel production. And we actually raised that at a, a conference we were both at, and you were there as well, in Saudi Arabia last um, September. And he, he was very honest and just said, look, we didn't foresee the, the level of changes that we've seen in the last few years in the development of China. So you're in good company there, so don't worry. Um, lots of questions coming in in the last 10 minutes or so. One here, all iron ore miners seem to push volumes to meet their yearly production guidance. Can Chinese iron ore demand match this supply or shall we expect an oversupply in the coming months? Well, for the moment, yes, um, but only because Chinese steel production is at such elevated levels. So there's, there's two factors sustaining that. One is the fact that we've seen a pretty extraordinary year in terms of stimulus and the recovery in infrastructure and um, uh, construction activity and that obviously has an impact on other steel sectors as well you know engineering you know, excavator production is almost doubled year on year um, but once that steel demand pulls uh, down and steel production is less supported then you will start to see more pressure on iron ore prices and that market should become a little less tight um, the question is not really whether it will become less tight, but how quickly and when it will become less tight. I think. Thank you. I've got a sort of parallel question uh, relating to scrap here, which is, Borchak, will the winter months cost increase seen in fuel freight, scrap collection, snow laden ports, bad weather, push scrap prices to a 2020 high in the final quarter? I don't think so. I think, uh, you know, as addressed during my presentation, uh, scrap, there is no problem in scrap availability and will not be a problem in the fourth quarter as well. So uh, prices may uh, increase further up to 310 levels, I agree, but uh, not more than that. Okay, thank you. I've got somebody here who's asked a couple of questions, one about um, Turkey and one about spot pellet premium. So I'll start with the, could you please comment how competitive has been the Turkish blast furnace producers compared to EAF ones? Something you touched on in your presentation. Yes, I also uh, addressed this during my presentation. At the moment with uh, iron ore prices at 130 levels and scrap 
let's say at 300, because this was the latest deal, electric arc furnaces have the advantage. Iron ore is much more expensive for uh, producing steel. Thank you. And from the same uh, delegate, one for you, Thomas, what's your forecast? Putting you on the spot here for the spot October Q4 pellet premium. We don't um, give numerical forecasts in that detail, but what I would say is that that is going to be pushed around really by the, the fundamental change in the market, which is the market is going to be looser. Um, so far, you know, pellet premiums haven't actually reacted very strongly to strong demand, but that's really partly been due to uh, the, the shortage of, you know, medium grade fines, uh, which has pushed up medium grade fines relative to pellet premiums, really, relative to pellet. pellet. Um, as steel demand begins to, to pull off and demand for iron ore begins to pull off, um, you could see an increase in pellet premiums with a relative decline in medium fines, but actually I think that the area of the market that's more likely to win out is the lower grade fines. It, it seems like as prices are pressured lower and margins are thin, Chinese steelmakers will be looking to cut costs. And so they will go into this kind of cost cutting mindset where they're looking for um, you know, low cost iron ore products in order to sustain production at a lower margin or a higher margin. Thank you. So the mirror image of the steep rise we saw in 65% of feed prices when the market was buoyant. Right, exactly. Thank you very much. Um, related question there, tangential. How long can steelmakers be pressed by high import costs, scrap and iron ore, and buyers' requirements for low prices in a still weak and uncertain market? And I'll go to, I'll stop, stick with you, Thomas, on that, but then I'll go to Burchak's import as well, please. Well, to a certain extent, that's the perennial question, right? I think um, uh, apart from possibly in 2008 and in China in 2016, steelmakers have always been squeezed between um, the fact that they struggle to increase steel prices and raw material costs have always been eating into their margins. Um, I don't expect that to change going forward, especially as I think we're coming out of a very strong period for China and it will be weakening. I think that margins will remain under pressure for uh, the foreseeable future, at least uh, from, from China. Thank you. Um, one that's just come in from some you sent about five in. So this is their fourth question, I think. Until when will China demand go on as a net importer, do you think? So China is a net importer. It's already starting to lose some steam, um, really because of the um, the time lag in, in delivery. So uh, there was a very large volume uh, booked in time for peak Chinese steel demand in September and October. But obviously purchases made now will be arriving at the start of Q4, really. And so they will be arriving at a period when Chinese steel demand is declining and uh, steel inventories in China still remain high and the outlook for the coming year is uncertain. So the, the momentum behind imports is already starting to fade. Um, at the moment, there's no sign that China in the immediate future is going to become a net exporter again. Um, but that trade should balance out between exports and imports towards the second, towards the uh, the end of Q4. Excellent, thank you very much. I'm conscious of the fact as I look at my screen that we're an hour and 10 minutes into this webinar and we usually try and, we usually stick to around an hour, an hour and 15 minutes. So I think what we'll do there is we'll close that off. I'd like to say a massive thank you to Borchek and Thomas for sharing your thoughts and for answering questions. I'd like to thank everybody who's uh, participated today and sent in your questions. I'd also like to remind you that next Wednesday, we have our um, Global Steel Markets webinar, and the following Wednesday, we've got our Asia Talking Points webinar. And we also have a Kalanish Virtual Conference for Asia on the 21st and 22nd of October. So please look out for the emails for those. We wish you all a very safe and happy continuation of your work and thank you very much once again for joining us. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.